All right, Ahmed, whenever you're ready. Okay. Recidivism is the return of an offender to criminal... Sorry, sorry. Can I start again? Yeah, start over. Okay. Okay. Recidivism is the return of an offender to criminal behavior, or in other words, reoffending or committing the same crime after being released from prison. Discussing the cause for recidivism and how it's measured, what's the solution that can be done to prepare the inmates to merge into society and how, and how recidivism can be prevented. All of that be reviewed within five journals, articles being written by expertise in the field and it's been connected together and it's been connected together between several aspects and point of view. At the end of my informative speech, the audience will be able to identify the reasons of recidivism growing in the United States and how to reduce it. Let's begin with what is recidivism and how it's measured. The return of an offender to criminal behavior by committing another crime or same crime, which is the level of felonies, is the recidivism term. Mary Bosworth in Recidivism, Encyclopedia of Prison and Correctional Facilities, stating the reason that people reoffend vary. The degree to which any particular factor may cause someone to commit another crime is unclear. As Bosworth stating, Reasons that prisoner reoffend cannot be determined under any circumstances because it vary and mainly depends on what was the committed crime. Majoring it depends on many factors. Clarency in the recidivism encyclopedia of interpersonal violence states agency measures of recidivism present further difficulties in that such measures does not depend solely on the behavior of the offender, but also on the behavior of others, including the willingness of victim and other to report to these authorities. So clear research, clarify the measures of causes is not determined only on the criminal itself, but also on the willingness of others to report to the authorities. In this case, Causes and measures does vary from each offender to other, starting maybe from incorrigibility, failure of sanction, or failure of program, or other causes. All at the end will lead to why the offender reoffend even after the punishment. Let's now see what solution can be done to this problem. Currently, there is a pre-release program and uh, Mary Bosworth in release programs encyclopedia of prisons and correctional facilities stating the vast majority of, of inmates, 97%, will be released back into society, but few have the skills to survive legally. As Bosworth states, most of the inmates get out of prison, but only few can live their life back again in a normal way. That's because many inmates receive little to no education or treatment toward their reduction. Also, it might be caused from not having a family support after they have been released. There is also another solution currently, which is the work release program. Mary Bosworth in work release programs encyclopedia of prison and correctional facilities stating, Work release programs are designed to allow the inmate to develop job skills and disciplines and to give them opportunities to perform meaningful community service. As Bosworth states, the effectiveness of the work release programs are great due to the giving the opportunity to self and skills development by participating in the normal community. Like when they are, before they get out of prison, they can merge into community, like for community service, cleaning, and that stuff. But eventually, this program being shut down due to the what people convinced that it does threaten the public safety. Let's now see how recidivism can be prevented. There is a three strikes law being established at the beginning of 1993, which is Donna Batin in Three Strikes Laws, Gill Encyclopedia of American Law, stating concerns about the fairness and proportionality of the law have been raised when an offender is sent to prison for 25 years for shoplifting or some other minor property crime. 
like as he states, for example, when someone commits shoplifting for three times, they're going to be sent to prison for life. That's not fair. And it's fair because it's a crime, but eventually it's not fair. He will do mistakes. So if someone shoplifts for three times, he doesn't deserve a life sentence. So this law is strict and also it's prevent. It shows that it reduced the recidivism. Establishing educational program, making it mandatory. More education, less crime eventually. So let's now review the point that we have talked about today. We have discussed the three main topics about recidivism. What is it and how it's measured? Prepare the prisoner to merge into society and how it can be prevented. By now, my audience should be able to identify these factors and thinking of a better solution for this. Thank you. All right, who's next? Um, I'll go. Okay. Unless you want to, it doesn't matter to me. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Have you have you ever met a rock star? I haven't either, but I have met a rock star in my field. And this past week, um, UW held or hosted a conference or an international conference for uh, for the for physical education. And here is where I met Peter Hasty, and he is the one of the furthermost. Um, researchers in physical education and the sport education model. Um, in one of his one of his articles, he wrote, "Sport education has reached its goal of educating students to be players and to help them develop as competent, literate, and enthusiastic sports people." Um, and that was in 1998. And in the past 18 years, this education model has gained a lot of popularity. Um, but I'm sure many of us have yet to yet to experience this type of thing. So today I'm going to give you a glimpse into the sport education model and its benefits. Um, let's begin with what sport education is. Um, it can be implemented in a number of sports. We can even we can do um, hockey, basketball, uh, individual sports such as golf, and in my personal experience, we've done gymnastics. And um, it has a few key characteristics. Um, these characteristics include seasons rather than units. So you would have a long season of basketball, which would maybe be half of your semester. It's longer than your original, like traditional three week units of any given activity. Um, you'll be affiliated with a team. So you would have a team, you'd have a name, you'd be with that team the whole season. So you'd get a lot of camaraderie and you each have roles. So if I, I'm really good at soccer, so if I would probably be a soccer coach, there would be a trainer, there'd be lots of other there's scorekeepers and things of that nature. Um, and then competition, um, which is just like standings, there's a playoff and there'd be a, like a championship or a final event. There's record keeping, so you would have a board which um, shows you where your team is and where you have gained points, whether that be from wins or um, like sportsmanship points as well as hustle points for like getting back to when your teacher like needs to call you in and finally a culminating event which is like from in my experience for our gymnastics we had a gymnastics meet and so like the whole building came in to watch us perform our sequence and then they all voted on who was the best um so vast this, these are vastly different than the traditional sport um like education so where you just have three weeks of basketball and you move on um, so which, with that comes a lot of benefits, and now I'll be telling you about these benefits. Um, one of the, and the benefits align with the key features. So I talked about affiliation. So affiliation, you would be with a well-balanced team. It would be um, a really good player with, like, a really bad player. You'd, all the teams would be even, so fair. So it's not just all the highly skilled students nominating PE. Um, and accountability as I talked about the student roles you, you're you get your role and you have that role throughout the whole season so you're accountable for being a ref or being a coach and starting your practices with your team and leading your team um Dr. Seedenhoff the creator of this model stated in his time at Oregon State that this model creates an inclusive learning environment not 
just for highly skilled students and that has a lot to do with participation and for me that's where this model really hits because in all my PE classes there would be kids who didn't participate and or and all the highly skilled students are like the ones driving it but with this every player has to contribute with no matter what the event or thing is um other benefits include um it's student-centered so i won't if i'm the teacher i won't be the only one telling you how to dribble a basketball if someone's really good at basketball they may have a better point of view to give to the lower skilled students than me as the teacher always telling you what to do and another thing as i mentioned the seasons are longer so therefore, like you'll have more time to improve, not only at the skills, but also at like competency and knowing what you're doing. Um, so now let's review the sport ed model and its benefits. Like I said, it can do many sports. You can go soccer, gymnastics, hockey, or cricket even. Um, the key features are such as seasons, competition, and affiliation. And these benefits go along with those, um, participation, affiliation, and um, they're longer. Um, we may not be able to change the experiences we had in PE, but um, with more knowledge about ways we can present physical education, we um, may be able to change future generations of experiences. And if you, if we all compete, we all win. Good job. Thank you. Okay, last but not least. My turn? Yes. Nice. Okay. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, can you please, before I start, show me how to do the sharing? Oh, yeah. Share so wiggle with... your mouse, and at the bottom, there's the share screen that's green. Mm -hmm. So click that, and then we can see what's on your computer screen. Nice. So. Did you click it? Yep, there we go. Yes, so. you can see everything on your screen. Yeah. Okay. There you go. All right, yeah. Uh, so my topics today is going to be about the three branches of the U.S. government. Okay, according to this image, actually, I will also speak um, about the three branches. Uh, the first one is... Uh, legislative branches, which is play, um, playwrights, and executive um, branches, which is theater sponsored and owners, and the last not least, the uh, um, judicial branch directors. Let me just a minute to close this and. Okay, <clears throat> so um, let's begin to talk about the first branch. I will, I will now explain every branch and um, uh, but I will explain every branch on the pictures that you saw. So according to that uh, analogy, actually the digestive, the, the digestive branch which is a playwright, the legislative branch, which is play, uh, of the play, uh, like need two parts actually to complete it, to be completed. Uh, the first one is Senate. Uh, the first part is the Senate, and there are two elected senators, peer total, uh, total 100 senators. And the second part is the House of Representatives, which are are for, uh, for 435 elected representatives divided among the 50 states uh, on a proportion of their total population. Uh, the, third, the third one in, part, um, in a play, the, uh, the playwrights need a paper or representative uh, to write the script and they, the amount of paper needed is divided based on the number of or the states and the population of words being seen in the entire script. Uh, what are the duties of uh, leg legative branches? H have you ever wondered about all these laws that we have to follow? That we have to follow. Um, 
uh, and where uh, where they come from, or when even propose uh, proposes or write them up. Uh, well, it's the legislative uh, uh, branch. According to US government, uh, the duty of uh, legislative branch is to induct legation, confirm or reject the presidential appointments. And it is clear where, in the simple term, the uh, legislative branch uh, makes or writes laws a sign of our. Um, of onwards and the presidential appointments. Uh, just like the legislative branch, the play, um, the play rights, uh, the play or laws confirm the characters of a play kind of like approving or project uh, or reject presidential appointments and declares what actions, what actions happen in scenes um, like declaring where. Uh, second, um, second thing on the same analog, um, the, ex, uh, the executive branch, the executive branch, theater sponsored and um, and honor, which is which is like the honor and or sponsored um, of the play. Uh, the executive branch is composed of, of different parts. First one, the presented, uh, the present, who is the head of the state. And the leader, um, and and the leader of um, of the uh, county, actually country, is like the owner who is a big boss and the leader of of it of, of it all. According um, according to a tour of the three branches written by uh, Rosa Nina, the president is responsible for uh, signing, enforcing and executing uh, legal, legal or laws created by Congress. And he can also uh, veto, veto it. This just like if honor, believe Scott is given to go ahead production and if doesn't like it, he can't uh, veto or shut it down. Second, a president also has people um, uh, under him, an executive branch, which includes the vice president and the cabinet. Just like the owner has people that uh, will advise him on whether play is good enough uh, to be produced. The presented uh, also has his counsel and his form of a president and cabinet members uh, who can advise him on deci uh, decisions to be made about different policies uh, um, or um, legas, leg, legations. Now we have discussed two branches, actually the first two branches of the government. Let's move to the third one and the final part of the government, uh, which is uh, judicial branch, like uh, a director. So A, the judicial uh, Judicial branch, sorry, judicial branch interpre interprets the meaning of laws, applies laws in individual cases, and decided if laws violates and contributions. So, um, <clears throat> in a play, there can be director and multiply assistant director in the uh, uh, judicial branch. Other government, there is a Supreme Court, uh, the director, and the Federal Court, uh, the assistant directors. Uh, in Nina Rose magazine, uh, the Supreme Court is the highest court where the, just, um, where the justice are um, appointed by the president, just like the director appointed the uh, owners, the president. The Supreme Court talk, uh, takes on the highest, most sensitive cases and may overrule uh, the decisions of federal courts, just like the directors, and overall the decisions of my assistant director. Uh, third, the same and assist director may be char charged overlook other parts of the play, like the uh, characters of the uh, dressing 
room and so on in the same way of federal courts are responsible for the other smaller cases. Uh, fourth one and the last one is according to Rose also, the cases that the federal courts aren't equipped, um, equipped to handle them gets pushed uh, to the Supreme Court just like uh, the matters that the assistance director cannot handle gets passed on the director. Now, uh, let's quickly review the three uh, branches of government we have uh, discussed. Um, we have discussed the, the, the three branches of the government, the, legis uh, the, the legislative, uh, executive, and judicial branch uh, in detail. We have also related um, it's a play for better visualizations, uh, just in case all that detail was too much uh, to take on. Let us now summarize in the simple terms. Uh, the legislative branch is Congress and they make the laws. Uh, the executive branch is the president, vice president and cabinet. Um, and they uh, carry out the law. Finally, the, ju uh, the judge shell branch is made up of the federal and Supreme Court, and they inter um, interpret, interpret uh, the law. So next time you go see a play or even a movie, just remember this, this put together uh, full functions, just like the United States government, and hopefully, uh, hopefully that will uh, judge your mem uh, memory. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to stop our recording.